from the material last time. Okay, last time we discussed different ways of measuring income inequality. We uh, examined some of the effects of income inequality on health, <coughs> both at the individual and the collective levels. And we began to consider some of the mechanisms for this effect, including the possibility of social comparison and a hierarchy uh, with the example of walking through first class uh, in, the, in the airplane. And, uh, and, we, and, we, and we introduced a number of possible explanations linking income inequality to individual health. How might it be the case that residing in an area with relatively more inequality when it comes to income, what might be some mechanisms by which that could come to affect your health. And we finished the lecture last time talking about the last thing on the list here, the so-called individual income explanation, which was this sort of artifactual or kind of straightforward reason having to do with the nonlinear relationship between income and health at the individual level. And then we introduced these two other broader categories, the neo-material environment explanation, which says you are harmed in, in unequal environments, uh, un environments in which income is unequally distributed, uh, that prompts other features in the environment, for instance, underinvestment in public goods. People stop caring when there's a lot of income inequality. People stop investing in preventing air pollution. And as a result, everyone suffers, for example. Something about the neo-material environment. Neo because we mean the modern world, the modern uh, material environment. And the second class of ideas had to do with the psychosocial environment. So if you're in an unequal environment, you see that other people are richer than you or have more wealth than you do. And this might have a number of effects, either within your body, physiologic stress effects, or psychologically. These would be the psychosocial environment explanation. How your relative standing compared to these other people might harm you, quite apart from how the environment around you uh, is changed. And it turns out that the association between income inequality and mortality is considerably stronger, as we finished the last lecture, than can be accounted for by the concavity at the individual level. Something else must be going on to help explain this relationship. And we introduced some of these mechanisms uh, the last time. And these mechanisms, of course, are not mutually exclusive. In fact, multiple ones of them have obtained. And they can reinforce each other. And of course, may operate at different levels of geographic aggregation, larger and smaller, respectively. So not exclusively, but roughly speaking, the new material um, environment explanations operate at bigger levels. You know, so in an unequal society, people lose interest in paying taxes. And the state, you begin to have state breakdown, for example, or less investment in clean water and clean air and public schools and, and good trauma centers and so forth. Because the rich feel, oh, I'll just build my own trauma center for just me. I don't care about anyone else, for instance. Or we won't bother to build it. It's not going to affect me. Uh, and, the, and the psychosocial ones tend to operate on shorter levels. You, you guys right now really are unaware of the wealth in Houston, most of you, and you really don't care. It doesn't really affect you in the slightest. But you are aware of relative economic standing, for instance, among other Yaleys, or in New Haven. You might look around New Haven and say, oh my God, those people are so poor, we're at the top of the heap, for example. And so you might have an appreciation, and then the, that closer in awareness at that smaller level of geography might have a some effect. So it is, it is the case that a kind of, uh, uh, that a reduction in income inequality, as we discussed the last time, via income transfers can improve health as a result of the concave nature of the health wealth curve uh, that we introduced, operating at an individual level. So last time, for example, let's say you're in the orange curve. Here is the uh, orange curve, just to repeat the ideas from last time, uh, from the United States. And, uh, and here is the health of the individual. This is individual level now. Here's the person's income. And so if you know your income, what's the prediction about your health, x and y? And the idea is that, oh my goodness, if we take away x wealth from this individual and transfer it to this individual from x1, move, take x4 minus x3, remove this fixed amount of wealth from this person and give it to this person, this person, because of the nonlinear relationship between the two, this person will lose a tiny amount of health over here, but this person will gain a significant amount of uh, health over there, the difference between that point and that point. And that's why even though the average wealth remains the same, the average health can go up if you transfer wealth from the rich uh, to the poor. But we began to introduce the idea, the last time that assumes that there's a static, that the curve doesn't move. But the curve, of course, could move if you began implementing a kind of wealth transfer regime 
or the curve could move because you're in different kinds of society. In other words, another way that reducing income inequality might improve health at the population level would be that such a reduction in inequality might shift the whole curve up or down. So now we can begin to think about the idea it's not just movement along the curve, the whole curve might have a different position in space. And reducing inequality in a given society might move the whole curve up. Therefore, for any given wealth, every single person is improved in that society. That is, something about living in a context with less inequality might change the whole set point of the wealth-health relationship for everyone. Thus, the green curve might be Sweden, and the orange curve might be the United States, and for any given income, everyone fares better in Sweden. And conversely, if there's more income inequality, for instance in Ghana, the, uh, the curve could be shifted down. And that is, the argument that income inequality can work to actually move the curve up or down altogether, uh, the argument is that the income inequality can move the curve up or down altogether and not just move individuals along it. So what might be the mechanisms by which income inequality might actually shift this curve up or down? We talked a little bit about the neo-material ideas the last time, so let's discuss a little bit more about the psychosocial ones today. So hierarchy and inequality, especially if they're long-standing and cumulative, if across your life you're constantly exposed to them, can affect individuals' health. And indeed, the point is that hierarchy has always mattered because it mattered at the beginning when we evolved from our primate ancestors. So hierarchy has always been a part of our species, always affecting your health wherever you are. It's not just nowadays that income inequality might affect us. And part of the reason that a minimum that we remember we discussed the last time as well, this idea of was there a step function, is you got a more wealth, did you just have a flat health until all of a sudden you got just enough uh, income and then there was a step up and then afterwards it was flat. No, it's not like that. There's a kind of monotonically increasing, constantly not linear but sort of curvilinear, concave down relationship between wealth and health. Part of the reason that a minimum amount of income is not enough to efface hierarchy and its effects on health is that people have needs beyond basic necessities, beyond being merely above the poverty line. And it turns out that these needs should ideally be met if we are to be healthy, both physically and mentally. And these needs can be arranged in the very famous Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And they're important because they help shed light on the health wealth uh, relationship and on why that relationship is not a step function. So the idea is that human beings have many kinds of needs. At the bottom are our physical needs, you know, air, water, food, exercise, freedom from diseases, and so forth. And then security. Uh, sort of safety, security, uh, shelter, and stability. Our social needs, the need for being loved, belonging, and feeling included. Satisf uh, satisfaction of our ego uh, needs, the need for self-esteem, power, recognition, and prestige. And these needs are met through the achievement, recognition, promotions, and bonuses. And finally, Maslow put at the top of the uh, pyramid the need that human beings have for self-actualization, the need for development and creativity. And these needs are met through autonomy, and achievement. But the idea is, is that actually, just, as because we, just because we satisfy the bottom needs for everyone in our society, by and large, it doesn't mean that that's it. There's still a kind of hierarchy of needs that we might still want to meet for people. And people could still array themselves across this hierarchy. And in fact, when you think about it, in the United States, the wealthiest country, or one of the wealthiest countries in the world, when you travel the distance along the 12 mile distance uh, in the Washington DC metro uh, from downtown Washington DC to Montgomery County, Maryland. So you just imagine this hypothetical experiment where you go into the subway in downtown DC and you just go 12 miles to one of the suburbs. And you think about the life expectancy of the people on the surface of the planet above you as you're doing this, uh, this movement. Poor black men at one end of the journey in central DC might have a life expectancy of 57 miles, and rich white men at the other end might have a life expectancy of 77 years. I'm sorry, 57 years and 77 years. 20 more years. Every mile you go underground, there's about two extra years of life expectancy accruing to the people on the surface as you move through it. And this difference between in life expectancy cannot be explained by our societies not meeting people's physical needs at the bottom of the pyramid, right? 
Even the people in the middle of, in, of BC have air, water, food, exercise, rest, freedom from diseases, plus or minus, uh, and so forth. Those needs are being primarily met. And so in fact, the argument is that something else is going on here, that man does not live by bread alone. And there are more needs, it turns out, than those that can be acquired by having enough income simply to avoid poverty. And in particular, those needs are needs for autonomy, psychological integrity, and integration into society. We have these other needs our species does beyond just eating uh, and drinking. And these are actually key needs, as we're going to see in just a moment. And there's a social gradient in health, even when we move beyond meeting the lowest needs of people, even after we correct the problem of lack of food and water. And it may have something to do with whether these other needs are being met. And this may be why, even as people's material needs are met, we still can observe this hierarchy. Is that point clear? OK, so failure to meet these needs, these higher needs, may lead to metabolic and endocrine changes that in turn place people at risk for uh, illness and death. And there are fundamental processes in our species encoded within us that make us sensitive and responsive to this hierarchy, that make our bodies change if we're lower on the pyramid compared to the top of the pyramid. Now, as usual, figuring out the causation here, figuring out what is coming first isn't easy, and there's a large body of research that's trying to understand the extent to which these things obtain. So let's look very briefly at some basic biology, some of which is taken uh, from your readings. Groups of social animals, including primates, often maintain hierarchies that involve dominance. The guy at the top sort of steps on the guy at the bottom. And this, in turn, can produce market inequalities in access to resources. So if you're at the top, you get more than if you're at the bottom. And this can then further reinforce the hierarchy in a rich get richer kind of scheme. For example, one recent report showed that higher ranking primates ate food from the top of the tree. When I first read this, I said, what possible difference could it make where you get your food from on a tree? I mean, I mean, what would it matter if you were bottom of the tree versus top of the tree? Well, it turns out the fruits on the top of the tree get more sun. And that sun changes the composition of the fruits. Actually, the fruits from the top of the tree are more nutritious. So the higher, even in primates, the higher ranking primates get to pick the juiciest fruits from the tree that, and that get better nutrition and that for, reinforces uh, the hierarchy. But it turns out that our species and other species have evolved a kind of way of coping uh, with this. And one of the key ways of coping is this idea of being social, of sociability. And sociability is often a counterbalance to the stressfulness of such a hierarchy. And you can get a sense of that as described in the readings by contrasting the left-hand images uh, with the right-hand images. So here, these, uh, these animals here are engaged in different kinds of interactions, social interactions, than these animals, which are engaged in a more violent kind of interaction. This is clearly the subordinate animal, and this is the superordinate animal. We can imagine it's more stressful uh, to be this animal. So one of the interesting things about our species is that over the great, you know, the vast majority of our, our evolution as, a, as Homo sapiens sapiens, the chief threat to our survival was actually other humans, right? We actually have very few natural predators. So the main challenge we faced in evolving was in figuring out how to get along with each other. And we've evolved a set of tools to cope with the coexistence of other human beings near us who are, can both aid us and threaten us. So there's a kind of balance between the threatening nature of other people and the ability of other people through social interactions to buffer that stress, to make it less stressful, and to reduce it. And many of these effects are in fact connected to basic ideas from sociobiology. And as the evolutionary biologist Richard Alexander has pointed out, the primary hostile force of nature encountered by human beings is in fact other human beings. And we share, of course, the same basic needs that they do, and so we're in competition with them in a variety of ways. So, um, so according to uh, Wilkinson, in some, cited in one of your readings, we may think of two contrasting ways to organize human population in a kind of dominance hierarchy way in a kind, and in a kind of friendship equality way, both of which actually have left their marks on our bodies and, our, and on our behaviors. Now, I don't mean to suggest some kind of deep-seated biological basis for particular political systems. I'm not making an argument for you know, communism or libertarianism right now. I'm just describing a kind of uh, uh, the reality that we evolved uh, 
both uh, wanting to be near other people because they can help us, but also competing with other people and afraid of them because they can be violent towards us. And in fact, we have evolved a number of biological capacities um, and that, that we should not be surprised to find in humans' bodies and that we should not be surprised to find still manifesting their effects in response to the kinds of heightened socioeconomic inequality that are features of modernity and of modern uh, social order. For example, as part of the fight or flight response, our bodies quite adaptively release hormones which make blood uh, clotting easier. So when you are, you probably all learned this in high school biology, when you're under threat, you have a fight or flight response. Your body pumps up uh, epinephrine, uh, adrenaline, and other hormones, and those hormones have immediate effects in your body. For example, one of the things that they do is, is that they clamp down on the blood supply to your intestines and open up the blood supply to your skeletal muscles, preparing you to fight or to run, for instance. It's a very simple example. You probably raise your hand if you study fight or flight in high school. Yeah, everyone. Others, they have other more subtle effects you may or may not remember from high school. You probably certainly remember the example I just gave you. But other things they do is they, they make your pupils widen and your nares, your nostrils widen. Why, do they, why, do, why does that happen as part of fight or flight? Anyone know? Yeah? A oh, Rosario? You can see better and you can take in more oxygen. Yeah, you can see better. Your, your, your eyes widen, your nose widen, your ears actually cock forward slightly so you can let in more information about what's happening uh, when, when you're facing this threat. Another thing that the fight or flight response does is it pumps out more fibrinogen. And fibrinogen is a precursor to clotting factors in our bloodstream. Why would your body do that? Why would your body, when it's in a fight or flight mode, suddenly produce more fibrinogen? I forgot your name. Leah. Leah. Yeah. So you're going to be clawed by this bear, by the saber-toothed tiger. You need to prepare to clot. Now, what happens if I frighten you? I give you an examination or something, or I give you a math test. <laughs> and, uh, and your body goes, oh my god. And it starts pumping out epinephrine. And you start putting fibrinogen in your bloodstream. But actually, I don't attack you or assault you. And you don't have any need for clotting. Well, that fibrinogen actually now is no longer a, an aid to you. It's a problem. That fibrinogen contributes to clotting inside your coronary arteries and elevates your risk of heart attack. You see? So being chronically stressed, even though it's adaptive to have a fight or flight response to brief threats, actually being chronically stressed, for example, by being at the bottom and having people step on you, elicits in you naturally evolved biological responses, which now actually can come to harm you in a variety of ways. And in fact, it's been seen that among monkeys, and presumably among our ancestors, the most common attacks were indeed from other members of the same species, with dominant members of the species attacking subordinates. And higher levels of fibrinogen are also found not just in apes and monkeys, but also in British civil servants. So in the reading for today, Marmot talks about how if you look amongst British citizens working in Whitehall for the government with the National Health Service, if you look at the occupational hierarchy within the British civil service, you find that people at the bottom have higher circulating fibrinogen than people at the top, all right? And this may be a biological mechanism by which hierarchy and inequality gets embodied, literally gets embodied, and then gets expressed in terms of risk factor uh, for disease. So hierarchy and individuality, uh, and in, I'm sorry, so hierarchy and inequality, especially if long-standing and cumulative, can affect individuals' health. And the, the point is that hierarchy still matters because it mattered when we evolved in the first place. <clears throat> now, stressors can be of various kinds and can elicit various bodily responses. So one definition of a stressor is that a physical stressor is an external challenge to homeostasis, to sort of biological equilibrium. And a psychosocial stressor is the anticipation, justified or not, that a challenge to homeostasis looms. Psychosocial stressors typically engender feelings of lack of control and predictability and a sense of lacking outlets for the frustration caused by the stressor. And both types of stressors activate an array of endocrine and neural adaptations. Now, one of the things that's interesting about our nervous system and the way it's hardwired is, uh, is that we adapt to stress, in part because our nervous system is set up that way. So uh, this morning, when you put your socks on your feet, uh, uh, did you feel them going on? Raise your hands. When you put your, who is not wearing socks right now? Okay, so everyone is wearing socks. When you put your socks on this morning, did you feel them going on your feet? Yes, okay. 
Are you aware of your socks? Before I started asking about your socks, were you aware of your socks? <laughs> no. In fact, even now, you're probably unaware of your socks, even though I'm asking you directly about them. So, um, so, and why is the reason for that? Why did you feel your socks going on this morning, but you don't feel your socks right now? Who knows? Raise your hands so I can see you. Yeah, in the back there. What's your name? Avery. Avery, huh? Yeah, so your brain is, de is, is developed to detect changes in your environment, not to detect the status of your environment. So this morning, it was really useful information to know that your socks were going on your feet. And so you noticed it. After a while, it's utterly unimportant that your socks are going on your feet, so you don't notice it anymore. OK, raise your hands if you're afraid of spiders. OK, well, who am I going to pick on? Raise your hands high. OK, you over there. What's your name? You, right there? Yeah. Yeah. Amanda, are you afraid of spiders? Yes. OK, and I'm not going to bring you up and put a spider in there. But I'm going to ask you to do a thought experiment. Imagine that I take your hand, and I handcuff it to the table, <laughs> and I put the biggest, grossest spider you could possibly imagine on your hand. How are you going to respond? Yeah, what else is going to happen? Yeah. Yeah. You're going to really freak out, right? You're going to like you're going to have a complete fight or flight response. You're going to get really, really anxious. Now, what happens if no matter how you beg and plead, I do not take the spider out of your hand? What happens eventually? Yeah, you would actually eventually calm down, right? So your heart rate would return to normal. You would stop getting sweaty. Eventually, you might even kind of look at the eight eyes of the spider and think it's kind of cute, maybe. Even. <laughs> you would kind of adapt and get and used to the spider. It's the same kind of idea. Now, what happened, however, if I took the spider away and then you repeated the experiment the next day and the next day? Every time, unless I actually did this in a deliberate way to try to get rid of your phobia, uh, you would respond in this kind of a frightened way. And that chronic activation of the neuroendocrine pathways actually can result in a significant damage uh, to your body. Because chronic and repetitive activation of the stress response by chronic psychosocial stressors such as constant close proximity to an anxiety-producing member of one's own species um, can increase the risk of numerous diseases and exacerbate such pre-existing diseases as hypertension, atherosclerosis, diabetes, immune suppression, and so forth. So the bottom line here is that low rank can be stressful, right? Because I oblige you to be near people who have a higher rank than you, just as if they were spiders in uh, Amanda's case. Moreover, as Angus Deaton, a Princeton economist put it, quote, the degree to which low rank is harmful to an individual is likely to depend on the number of people of higher rank, because each such person is in a position to deliver the threats, insults, and forced obeisance or ultimate violence that generates stress. Individuals who are insulted by those immediately above them insult those immediately below them, generating a cascade of threats and violence through which low rank individuals feel the burden not just of their immediate superiors, but of the whole hierarchy above them. So typically, lower ranks or statuses convey more stress, and they are, uh, and the lower they are, the more stressful they are. But a very important thing to understand about this little quick review of the notion of hierarchy and status, access to goods, and biological response that I've just given you, a very crucial thing to recognize is that, <laughs> that rank or status is a relative not an absolute concept. Therefore, the link between status and health suggests that there is a, a connection between relative standing and health. And it is very, very hard to eliminate relative standing, partly because it seems to be biologically hardwired, and partly because the natural lottery is inherent. There's always going to be people at the top and at the bottom, as we've been discussing throughout this class, because of the workings of the natural lottery, even if we were to eliminate the social lottery. So therefore, that means that people at the bottom are subject to this uh, pyramid of people above them who can lead to these cascading uh, threats, as we've been discussing. And humans have very clear ideas about their relative standing and about what it means to be relatively deprived of desirable attributes or goods. Here's a canonical formulation by W.G. Runciman from 1966, where he said, we can roughly say that a person is relatively deprived of x when one, he does not have x, two, he sees some other persons as having x, and three, he wants x, and four, he sees it as feasible that he should have x. 
And then note how even this formulation of, of, of relative deprivation immediately calls forth questions about social justice. It's hard to define this topic and discuss this topic without asking yourself questions of justice, morality, uh, and fairness. So let's look at some results uh, from humans. This is taken from your readings. This is the social status ladder that Marmot famously implemented in the White House study. Uh, and, and he asked people, and many people have since then have asked people, uh, think of this ladder as representing where people stand in our society. At the top of the ladder are the people who are the best off, those who have the most money, most education, and best jobs. At the bottom are the people who are the worst off, those who have the least money, least education, and worst jobs, or no job. Place an X on the rung that best represents where you stand on the ladder. And here, he numbers 10 and 9 and 1 and 2. Here are the best off people, and here are the best, worst off people. And people are asked to place an X on this ladder. And here is what he finds in terms of self-perceived status, where you are on the ladder, and the pre prevalence of health problems in male British civil servants. So these are all employed citizens of one of the wealthiest countries on earth, working for the government of that country, with liberal access to some of the best health care in the world through the National Health Service. How does their status, self-perceived status, how is it associated with their health? So here are people at the bottom, one or two, and here are people at the top, and this shows the prevalence of the conditions. So here at the, I'm sorry, here are these people at the top, they have 3.6% of them have angina, which is heart pain, versus 9.5% here. Here's a gradation of diabetes, almost a tenfold difference in the prevalence of diabetes from the top to the bottom. Here's depression, a uh, fourfold difference in prevalence of depression from the top to the bottom. Uh, here's respiratory disease, and here's perceived health, almost a tenfold difference in perceived health in this situation. So these results show a couple of things. First of all, they show that the subjective social standing is important. How you perceive yourself, where you are, relatively speaking, is associated with your health status in some way, first. And a second intellectual idea is that there's a continuous gradient in numerous health measures by this kind of social standing. It's not the case that uh, people at the, at the top, uh, at the bottom, have high rates, and then when you get to around here, bang, it moves up and stays steady. It's not a step function. It's a continuous across the whole gradient. So even those British civil servants that are one or twos, who rate themselves as one or twos on the ladder, have better <coughs> health than those that rate themselves three or four, let alone five, six, seven, eight. Uh, and 9, 10. And these results don't clarify the causal order, of course. We don't know maybe the people at the top rate themselves as being at the top of the status hierarchy because they have better health. So we don't know which is coming first here, first here the status uh, or the health. But they are nevertheless powerful indicators that the relationship is not a step function. And data such as this, with which we are now quite familiar, shows that being poor is associated with greater mortality. And no doubt, being very poor is quite bad for one's health. So this shows age-adjusted mortality rates for 10,000 person years, according to annual income. And once again, we see a gradient of mortality by income among white United States males. So the richer you are, pretty much monotonically, there's a little difference right there. Uh, the better off uh, your health, health is. And this may or may not seem obvious. Why should there be a continuous gradient? That's one of the key questions we're trying to address today. Why is there not a step function? Why is there a kind of continuous gradient? Why should the difference, for example, between $50,000 and $60,000 exist, or between $200,000 and $300,000? Why should it matter? Here's another example of this gradient in a large American sample. This study examined uh, functional health status in over 330,000 um, uh, Americans uh, who are 55 years of age or older across the full socioeconomic spectrum. Um, and what they found is that there was a social class gradient uh, showing that respondents with higher incomes had lower levels of functional limitation regardless of how far removed they were from poverty. And so once again here, if you look at this group, you find the uh, fraction of the functional limitations in men and in women according to where you are with respect to the poverty line by age and you can see that there's sort of downward sloping lines, especially among the men, uh, uh, both among the men and the women here, but for very elderly women, it's a slightly a flatter line. Um, and part of the reason it may be flattening for the elder people, so why does the slope of this line flatten out as you get older, is by the time you get older, the vulnerable members of the population have, been, have died. 
So the sick people die, and so as you get older and older, you find a leveling. So poor people uh, and rich people who are old have roughly similar health, uh, not, not fully similar, but more similar health uh, than, than uh, younger people uh, who have such an equal disparity. So there are a number of possible explanations for this gradient, this non-step function relationship between, um, between uh, 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 the relationship between health uh, and wealth. Uh, and, um, and the reason is that relative differences in status might translate into absolute differences in life chances by affecting two items in human needs. So how is it that if you all have the same amount of money to buy food and water, how is it then that these relative differences in your standing above and beyond that, how do they translate into uh, your, uh, into, your health, into your life chances with respect to health? And the argument is that there's something about your relative standing that gets mapped onto the capacity to achieve some objective on an absolute scale. So how do, what do we mean by that? Well, the idea here is that this relative difference in status might translate to absolute differences in life chances by affecting two key items in human needs, autonomy and social integration. So this goes back to Maslow's hierarchy. So when you're higher up in the hierarchy, you're more able to achieve autonomy and social integration. And as uh, economist Amartya Sen points out, it may not be what one has that is important, it may be what, what one can do with what one has that is important. Hence, a person's relative position on a scale of income may translate into an absolute position on what Amartya Sen calls capabilities. So even though the poor people in the United States have many times the wealth of those in other countries, so a poor person in the United States is absolutely richer than very rich people in, uh, in, um, in sub-Saharan Africa, what the poor person can do with his or her wealth here is less than what the rich person can do with his or her wealth in this other uh, country. Because the poor person here cannot do as much because they suffer from a lack of autonomy and social integration because they are less able to meet the higher needs on Maslow's list. In other words, it may not be one's position in the social hierarchy per se that is the problem. It may be what this position means for what a person can do in a given environment that is material. And it is the extent to which position affects opportunity for autonomy and social participation. Now this link can perhaps be broken by compensating for the hierarchy, by equalizing even if we cannot eliminate the consequences of the hierarchy, and by counterbalancing the natural and social lottery as we've been discussing for the class so far. For example, lower status can lead to low participation in social interactions and less reciprocity, and those are in turn associated with worse health. And social participation is not merely something that high status individuals acquire or make for themselves. Societies can, as a whole, also foster and control social participation. So we can craft institutions in our society that make it possible for even those people at the bottom of the hierarchy to have more social integration. And in so doing, attenuate the adverse impact of inequality upon those individuals uh, at the bottom. And this, in turn, leads us to the idea of social capital, a very important idea we'll be discussing later uh, in the class. And in fact, the way many societies are organized can lead high-status individuals to be better able to tap what social capital is available and to reap higher returns on that capital. Okay, so let me, here's some illustrations of this point. So I'm going to ask you guys a question in a moment, and I'm going to ask you the following question. Which of these conditions is preferable? Your current annual income is $50,000, and everyone else earns $25,000. Or your current annual income is $100,000, and everyone else earns $250,000. So look at those choices, A and B. And assuming equal purchasing power in conditions A and B, I want you to tell me which you would choose. So who would choose A? Who would choose B? OK, someone who chose A, raise your hands. Why did you pick A? Well, half of you chose A approximately. Why did you pick A? Yeah. Yes. What's your name? Justin. Justin, uh huh. Because relative, uh, everyone else here is so stats together. Uh, so, you're Yeah, so you figure, like, 
I just want to be better than everyone else. So I don't care what I'm making so long as I'm, uh, I'm better than everyone else. Okay. So why, who picked B? Gianna, why did you pick B? So you think your health would be better if you pick B than A. No, no, you're not picking a state of the world. You're picking a state for yourself. So, uh, so, uh, so you are picking the annual income of $100,000 and everyone else earns two fifty. dollars And your initial justification for that is that you can buy more with hundred grand than you can buy with fifty grand. And that's what makes you happy, even though, in fact, you're at the bottom of the pyramid in this latter society. Right? Okay, that's a trade-off. And, uh, and here's what happened uh, in last, uh, and so this is uh, from the original paper that did this experiment. Uh, here are the answers in people in general. 56% chose this condition and 44%. Here are the responses from last year's Yaleys. Most Yaleys would rather be top dog in a worse world like Justin. <laughs> uh, and 19% uh, and, uh, and, and would like to be the bottom dog uh, in another uh, kind of a world. People, Yaleys, with respect to this, would rather be relatively better off even if they are absolutely worse off. So you guys have already made an indication of this. You've indicated that what you really care about is your relative standing, not your absolute standing. It's not how rich you are that matters, you've indicated. It's where you are in the hierarchy that's really important to you, you said. Here's another example. Think carefully. Your physical attractiveness is a six on a 10-point scale, and everyone else is a four. Or your physical attractiveness is an eight, and everyone else is a 10. Think about this now, and decide what you're going to be. OK, who wants A? <laughs> OK, who wants B? OK, I'm going to remember you, because I'm going to call on you in about it. You're a lone B person. It's good. OK, now, and I, there are good reasons for both choices. So someone who picked A, raise your hand tell me the reason. Yeah, you in the middle there. What's your name? Joel, uh-huh. <laughs> I see, but no, I do know what you mean, yes. <laughs> okay, so, so Joel uh, really doesn't care how attractive he is. He just wants to be attract more attractive than anyone else. And uh, that's satisfied in this world. And he figures he's going to get more dates than anyone else if uh, he's in this kind of a world. Okay, and what's your name? Shannon. Shannon, Shannon why did you pick B? Okay, so same argument as uh, income. Another argument, yeah, what's your name in the back there? Uh, Daniel, uh-huh. Uh, Excellent! <laughs> so Joel is having sex with fours, but Daniel is having sex with tens. <laughs> uh, that's if Daniel can get a date, is the problem. <laughs> Okay, so you're beginning to zero in on the, the one of the issues here is the, the, the extent to which the good, whether it's wealth or, or uh, uh, appearance, is a relative good. You with me so far in this subtlety, right? It's a relative good. Here are the answers from the uh, reading and from you guys last year. 75% picked the first world uh, in the reading and among Yaleys. And last year, 25% picked Shannon's solution. Uh, this year was a less popular choice, I don't know why. Um, all right, let's look at another one. Um, so, um, uh, okay, here's another one. Would you rather be the top student at the near, think of where you grew up. Would you rather be the top student at the nearest community college to where you grew up, or would you rather be an average student at Yale? <laughs> all right, so when you guys came to Yale, for most of you, it was probably a shock, right? You were probably the top student in your high school, or in the top, and you come here, and what happens? <laughs> it's hard, right? It's hard here. It's totally different. So, but you didn't have to come here. You could have made a different choice. You could have gone to your local community college and been the top student there. Okay, who would think about this? Who wants to be A? Nobody. And who wants B? All right. 
So, uh, so you'd rather be me, and in fact, you're all here, so that's the choice you made. <laughs> that's, that's the choice that was made uh, last year. But it does begin to prove the point, right, about which, where you would like to be in the distribution. Okay, now here's another one. Here's another one that I hope will make you think a bit more now, whether you'd like to be a Yaley or not. It should be a pretty straightforward choice. Um, okay, so here you go. You can have four, week, four weeks of annual vacation, and everyone else could have five weeks. Uh, or you could have three weeks of annual vacation, and everyone else could have two weeks. Everyone understand the dilemma now? OK. Who would rather be A? Who would rather be B? OK, uh, what's your name? Yeah. What? Amelia. OK, hold your thought. I'm going to come back to you. OK, someone who picked A, raise your hands. OK, what's your name? Sarija. Sarija, why did you pick A? Okay, so you're happy to get four weeks of vacation. You'd rather be in A world than B world. Everyone else gets five because four is being a person in world A is better than being a person in world B. Okay, and uh, Amelia, Amelia, what was your name again? Yamile. 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 <laughs> so she's Amelia is going to be really pissed about the fact that other people, uh, she, she wouldn't enjoy her vacation in world A because other people who had more vacation in world B, it's gonna be a much more satisfying vacation, she feels, even though there's less of it, okay? We should introduce her to Daniel, and I think the two of them would be, we'll get along just fine. So, uh, uh, so um, okay, now, but what is the point of this example compared to the other example? It's a very, very important intellectual idea in this example, contrasted with all the others we just considered. What's that point? Yeah, Jason? Um, um, I'm sorry, Matt. Matt, yeah. Matt, yeah. Um, maybe this one is inherently Yes. This one is not an, a relative good. This is an absolute good, right? It's not like more appearance or more money translates into capabilities. This is the good itself, in fact. And actually, uh, Emile's, uh, Yamile's choice was an unpopular choice last year as it was this year. 8% picked that. Most people understand and would prefer to have uh, uh, more vacation, even if it's less vacation uh, than anyone else. So vacation is not a competitive good. While vacation days like money and appearance and the Yale education are desirable, having more vacation than others doesn't confer any competitive uh, advantages necessarily. Well, you could construct the argument that you know you'll everyone else will be exhausted from their short vacation, and now you have a longer vacation, and you'll be able to outcompete them in some other way. That converts the vacation uh, to a, a competitive good if you see it that way. Okay, so let's go back now to the lab. <clears throat> so here's the, the ladder, for example, and uh, this is not a trick question. Uh, who would you rather be in this ladder, A or B? Raise, A's at the top, B's at the bottom. Raise your hands if you'd rather be A and B. Okay, good. Nobody wants to be B. That would be hard to explain, but maybe you might be that. <laughs> okay, so here's A and B. Uh, and now who would you rather be? A or D now. So this is an absolute scale on the y-axis and that we have two ladders. Would you rather be A or D in this kind of a dilemma? Raise your hands if you'd rather be A. Raise your hands if you'd rather be D. Jenna, would you be D? No, if you can move up the ladder. Ah, so Jenna, uh, so if you can move up. Okay, that's a really good point. So no, you're stuck at D. <laughs> <laughs> you can't move up. So she probably would rather be A as there. Well, and of course, the point of this little illustration is to suggest that it's not just the absolute level, because A and D have the same absolute wealth. This is like the poor person in the United States is here, and the rich person in Ghana is there. So even though their wealth might be identical, actually, you'd rather be the rich person in Ghana, you level field, than the poorest person in Washington, D.C. You guys with me so far? OK. Now, who would you rather be? Would you rather be A or E? So think about it for a moment. Who would rather be A? Who would rather be E? Right, so now it gets a bit tougher. And this is at the core of the debate right now that's happening about wealth and inequality in our society. That's actually a left-right debate. So some people say, 
oh, we're going to all get richer. We're going to move from the left-hand ladder to the right-hand ladder. So even people at the bottom will be better off. But other people say, no, I don't care if I'm worse off. If I'm uh, better off, absolutely. I'm worse off relatively. And so you're making that choice now too. You're seeing there's a certain amount of absolute wealth you would trade off against, against a certain amount of relative wealth, and vice versa, right? I could eventually, I could vary E just enough. So for those of you that picked A to E, I could move E up just enough that you would pick E over A. So you'd be, rather be in the middle of this distribution than at the top of this one. And vice versa for those of you who had the opposite choice. I could make you richer and richer absolutely. And all of you would trade off absolute versus relative standing in this situation. OK, so now who would you pick? Would you rather pick, I'm going to give you three choices now, uh, A, D, or F, OK? So you can be A, D, or F, all right? So who would rather be A, D, F? OK, now I'm going to give you another choice. You're going to pick D or F. Who would rather be D? Who would rather be F? OK, so why would you rather be F, someone? Let's raise your hands. Raise your hand. Who wants to explain? Yeah, you. What's your name? Joe. Joe, uh huh? Because the difference between where I'm at and uh, the very top is smaller than the on the C, D. Exactly. So you care about the inequality. You don't just care about where you are. You care about the extent of inequality in the group above you. And if it's a more compressed group, you're happier to be near the bottom, right? So it's not just where you are absolutely once again, nor even relatively, it's the whole dispersion in the population. And of course, as you might imagine, this is the kind of situation that you might have. You might have Ghana, the United States, and Sweden. Going back to the beginning where I drew those curves for you, those uh, health wealth uh, curves at the beginning. And that might be why inequality or changes in health or wealth has different effects on health in these different societies. So let's look at some additional evidence for this. One hypothesis flowing from the observations we made earlier about the biology of hierarchy and stress uh, in primates is that relative deprivation will matter to an individual's health. So now we've established you care and our species cares about where you are located in this hierarchy and that this could translate into health effects. And the idea, once again, is that it is not so much one's absolute deprivation, if any, that matters, but one's relative deprivation. So what do we mean by relative deprivation? Well, what we mean is the following. Low income or status, <coughs> relative deprivation is low income or status relative to a reference group, which we believe can affect health. And this RD is the difference between your own income, say, or appearance or whatever, uh, and the average reference group income, given, excuse me, given that income is greater than Y sub I. So you are Y sub I, your income, and we want to know how does your income compare to your reference group, given that your reference group is above you, has more income than you do. And relative deprivation is an upward-looking, individual-level measure that depends on the income of others. So this is unlike the Gini coefficient, which was a, we discussed last time, it was, it was the Gini was a property of groups. We could not speak of your income inequality. We spoke of the group's income inequality. Relative deprivation, we can define for an individual. We can speak of your relative deprivation compared to everyone else in this room. So it's an upward-looking, individual-level measure that depends on the incomes of others. The richer the reference group, the higher the relative deprivation. So if I compare you to a bunch of billionaires, you will have, be relatively deprived uh, compared to them. And the relative deprivation describes an individual standing, and it's different for each member of the group. So each of you has a different relative deprivation. That's different than the average wealth of this group. You all face the same average wealth. And it's different than the inequality in this group. You all face the same inequality. You each have a different relative deprivation within this group. If inequality is the same for the entire group, it describes the distribution uh, of income. And here's the math for one measure of relative deprivation known as the Yitzhaki uh, index. Uh, and, and what we do is we take person I that has income, income, that has income Y sub I, and, uh, and he's a part of a reference group with n people. What we do is, is we, 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 we look at everyone y sub j that has in, that's richer than me. So we look at this room, we pick me, we identify every one of you who's richer than me, and we subtract my income from your income. And we only subtract that 
for the people that are richer than me. We compute that, and we sum across all j, that, that upside down a means for all, on the far right, for all y sub j greater than y sub i, and we divide it by n. We divide it by the entire sample in this room, not just the number of people that are richer than me. That's a crucial detail. You don't need to memorize that detail, but it's just important for this computation. And dividing by n ensures that relative deprivation is invariant to the size of the reference group. Otherwise, if n doubled, so would the relative deprivation. And the n here is the number of people in the whole sample, not just those uh, in the index case. So for example, Warren Buffett, who's poorer than Bill Gates, we do not think of Warren Buffett as being deprived by billions of dollars compared to Bill Gates, right? We don't think of, you know, if, if, um, if, Warren, if, if their wealth differs by three billion, so if, if uh, Gates is three billion dollars richer than Buffett, uh, we don't think uh, that uh, poor Warren Buffett has a relative deprivation of $3 billion. We take the $3 billion and we divide it by the 300 million Americans, and we com com conclude that Warren Buffett's relative deprivation is $10. Do you understand? Now, I am very relatively deprived compared to uh, Bill Gates, but Buffett is only $10 relatively deprived. Do you understand? Because we divide it by the whole population, so as you move up on the hierarchy, the number gets smaller, because, of course, the denominator stays for the whole population. And, and relative deprivation is an upward-looking measure. There are actually other definitions which are downward-looking. And if you talk about the dismal science, if you really want to get depressed, start thinking about computing this, uh, making a similar computation, which privileges the ability to step on others, like a downward-looking, like, I'm great because I can step. The more people I can step on, uh, the better off I am. So Yitzhaki is an upward-looking measure, but you could, of course, imagine uh, downward-looking measures as well. So here are some examples. Uh, giving the relative deprivation denominated in dollars for people with different incomes and with reference groups chosen by location and age. So for example, if this, is, this shows the example of relative deprivation, and for each reference group is defined by uh, the, the, the metropolitan area, the kind of uh, census uh, area, and age. So we have two areas, Hidalgo, Texas, and uh, New York, New York. And here we have young people, your age, 21 to 25, and middle-aged people, 46 to 50. And we say, OK, if you have an income of $25,000 in Hidalgo, Texas, your relative deprivation compared to other 21 to 25-year-olds living in Hidalgo is $4,725. If you have an income of $50,000 as a 21 to 25-year-old, your relative deprivation is $1,381. If you're earning 100 grand and you're this young age in Hidalgo, you have very tiny relative deprivation, it's $379. Does everyone understand where I'm at so far? Uh, and here's the complication for the older people, but now let's look at New York City. If your income is $25,000 in New York City, uh, you're actually the relatively deprived of $17,000, which is you know, more than three times or four times your Hidalgo relative deprivation. And if you're in 100 grand in New York City, you are relatively deprived by $5,000, compared to 379 here. <coughs> What's the reason for that? Who, who, who knows where Hidalgo, Texas is? OK, what is Hidalgo like? Yeah. Yeah, so what's the difference between earning $100,000 in Hidalgo versus uh, Manhattan? Yeah, what can you do with 100 grand in, uh, in New York City? You can rent a tiny little studio apartment if you're lucky. And once a week and once a month, if you're lucky, go out and have a, a meal with your friends. Uh, the rest of the time, you're you know, riding the subway and, and not doing so great. Actually, you're doing fine. But, you know, exactly. <laughs> but, uh, but if you're earning 100 grand in Hidalgo and you're 22, what can you do? Anything you want. <laughs> a very big uh, difference, right? If your reference group is worse in Hidalgo, poorer, and so forth, the same absolute level of income translates into different uh, relative standing. So the argument is that one's relative deprivation, one's standing in the hierarchy, is roughly the same if one earns, and furthermore, the argument is that it's roughly the same if you earn $25,000 in Hidalgo or, or $100,000 in New York. So your relative standing in Hidalgo, see the relative deprivation is five grand here and about five grand there, you would need to earn 100 grand in New York to have the same relative standing as 25 grand in Hidalgo. You see? Using this computation of relative standing comparing this number to this number. All right? And in fact, you can do about as much with 25 grand in Hidalgo as with 100 grand in New York in terms of your capabilities. 
to return again to your descent formulation. Translating your relative standing into your absolute standing, what can you do with that income in those societies? And here's how relative deprivation, again measured at the individual level, is associated with various health outcomes. So now let's look. This is a paper taken uh, uh, out of Rand uh, by Eigner et al. a few years ago. So it looks at, uh, given your relative deprivation, uh, how, um, how, uh, uh, how, what are these outcomes for depressed, anxious, and fatigue and poor health? Here's the baseline. Uh, so for example, the 14.5% of overall people are depressed. If you go down 25 percentage points on relative deprivation, you're uh, less likely to be depressed. If you go up 25 percentage points, you're more likely to be depressed by these percentages. Ditto for anxious and ditto for being fair or health. So if I compute for each of you your relative deprivation, this measure, above and beyond your absolute wealth, is associated with these outcomes. You become more anxious, more depressed, and judge your health to be worse or worse if the more you are relatively deprived. And other work done by these investigators suggests that even after controlling for individual income and a number of other covariates, relative deprivation appears to have a very large and statistically significant impact on your probability of death. Overall, the relative deprivation effect is quite meaningful. The effect of a one standard deviation increase in relative deprivation appears to increase mortality by 39%. <laughs> Similarly, those that are relatively deprived also are more likely to have high blood pressure, smoke, be overweight, not wear their seatbelts, and so forth and so on, above and beyond their absolute wealth. Earlier in the class, we talked about how the poor were at risk of all those things. Today, what I'm telling you is that it's not just whether you're poor or not, or how much money you have, it's where you are in the hierarchy, above and beyond how much wealth you have, that also affects these diverse sorts of health outcomes. So I'd like to close today. So are there any questions on this so far? Brooks. Yeah. Um, so on the slide before with the dollar bill versus New York, uh, if I'm misinterpreting this, does that mean that in a dollar bill, if you're between 21 and 25 and you're earning $100,000, you're actually somewhat deprived, like most 21 to 25 year olds are earning slightly more than you? Some very few are earning slightly more than you. That's right. You're almost at the top of the hierarchy. The only way to get to the actual top and have a zero RD is if you're the richest person, richest 25 year old in the dollar. Okay. Okay. But it's a tiny difference. Like, you don't really care anymore. It's like, if, I'd be happy to be Warren Buffett and have $3 billion less than Bill Gates. Okay. I mean, really, I, just for the record, those of you that want to know this. So, uh, <laughs> so, uh, so it doesn't matter, right? Other questions? Yeah, what's your name? Uh, Dustin. No, I didn't say it matters more than absolute. I didn't say that. I said in, in addition to absolute, it matters. I haven't taken a stand yet on whether it's worth. Yeah, go on. I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Can you speak up just a bit? Yeah, so the argument is, is that there are two different ways you can be stressed. One is just by being poor, that's stressful. But in addition, if you're relatively poor, you can be stressed. So the, the guy, this guy here uh, in, in Manhattan, that's earning this 50 year old in Manhattan, that's earning $50,000, isn't poor, is absolutely earning 50 grand. But nevertheless, it's relatively deprived by $87,000. They're low on the ladder. So the argument is that being low on the ladder so actually, uh, being E, instead of uh, being E, when you're low on this ladder, is worse than being A, who has less money, because A is at the top. So your relative standing can matter in addition to your absolute standing. It's a good question, just to clarify. And I have not taken the stand on which is worse. Both are bad, both relative deprivation and absolute deprivation. Yeah, what's your name? Chemo. 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 Um, Chemo. Yeah, so I, I, didn't say, I didn't say that. So you can define the reference group in different ways. And one of the tricky parts here is the, the group that you think is your reference group is very different than the group that I consider to be my reference group. 
So I might think of other 50-year-old uh, you know, white male you know, professors my junior year school. Or it might not even be that. My reference group might be nothing to do with my age, my sex, or my race. It might be other scientists. That's my reference group. I'm comparing myself to scientists. Uh, or, or, or Greeks, you know. I had someone send me, uh, apparently I'm one of the more commonly cited, the guy sent me this as if I should be really proud of this. Probably shouldn't say this. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> never mind. So, uh, <laughs> So it depends. It depends on your uh, on your reference group. I'm just suddenly realizing my tape. <laughs> uh, but anyway, so so uh, it depends on who you who you choose as your reference group, right? And the weird part is you choose your reference group, or I can find I can say other Yale as your reference group, or other people from your hometown. You know? um, can I answer your question? I, I forgot. To I just wondered what it was in that particular In this paper, what it was. Oh, I'm sorry. You asked about geographic area. So, so I could define reference groups in different ways. I could say, who are your friends? I could say, who is in your college at Yale? I could say, residents of New Haven. I could say, no, not residents of New Haven, residents of your hometown. I could say, other 20-year-old young people in this country, right? And of course, relative to each of those reference groups, you will fall in a different location. So it's a bit application specific, but as we introduced at the beginning of the lecture today, one of the things we were saying is, this relative, de your perception of the relative deprivation is typically operates over a narrow geographic, narrow geographic area or a narrower, smaller number of people than the yield material uh, effects on you. So you're affected by the pollution in the state, even though you're unaware of the wealth in Greenwich, for example. But you are well aware of the relative wealth, let's say, in Yale. So the geographic area has, yes, Matt. Um, do you explain at all the difference in, uh, for example, how people with $25,000 in New York and people with $25,000 in New York is possible? Yeah, so the, the, uh, one of these slides, I can't remember which one, cor cor corrects for purchasing power parity. Uh, but, uh, but that's the point in, 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 in part that you can do more with $25,000 in Dalvo, not just because of the value of the dollar, but rather because of where you are in the hierarchy. Your ability to, you know, attract the date, for example, you, you, it would be better. It would be, it would be easier for you to get a date of twenty-five grand in uh, Hidalgo than in New York. I was just telling you that. Now. Other ideas, other questions. Okay. Now I'd like to close by putting a face to some of these differences using uh, some remarkable photographs taken by Mark uh, uh, Leita uh, in his book Created Equal. And on the left is, uh, is a homeless man, Phil Dombrowski, from uh, Los Angeles, California. And the sign he's holding says, anything could help. And on the right is real estate developer Gerald Springer uh, from Houston, Texas. Here on the left, we have company president William Scott from Boston. Uh, and on the right is janitor Walter Johnson from Neptune City, uh, New Jersey. And the photographer here, it's just, it's, it's actually extraordinary. If you get the book, uh, or look at the book, uh, I'm just going to show you three or four because even just some of the others aren't suitable for showing you in class. But uh, uh, it's extraordinary the way he's been able to pick people who look so similar and yet have had very different uh, courses or fates uh, in their lives. Uh, here on the left, we have Am Amish teenagers, uh, Janie Zook and Sam Stoltzfus from Lancaster, Pennsylvania. And on the right, so-called punk teenagers, Otto Bixler and Brianna Holland uh, from Hollywood of California. Again, kind of showing you the different sorts of trajectories that very similar, similar ostensible individuals might have. And it's actually moving and troubling and relevant to contemplate the workings of the natural and social lotteries that assign us to absolute and relative rankings, let alone our own, uh, how we cope with the world that also contributes to our relative rankings. But we are no doubt assigned in part, our absolute relative standing in part, by the workings of the natural and the social lottery. And these are relevant both to individual and population level health. So there are a number of questions that are suggested by all of this and that are summarized in one of your readings for today in the uh, Deaton uh, reading, Policy Implications of the Gradient of Health and Wealth. And, and Deaton asks a number of important questions that I, I want you to think about and talk about uh, in section. Uh, and and he, he observes the following thing. He says, poor people die younger and are sicker than wealthy people. We know this, we've been discussing it, but is that a legitimate state of affairs? Uh, if a primary determinant of health is money, is economic redistribution sound health policy? 
to what extent does everything I've been telling you suggest that actually if we want to intervene with respect to health, we have to intervene with respect to wealth, that that's the real key. And as you saw earlier in the course, we saw how declining poverty across the last century is one of the principal drivers for improving health status in our society. If, as Maslow suggests, health and wealth are both important elements of human welfare, should, the, should those deficient in one also be deprived in terms of the other? Does that make sense? Would we want, as a civilized society, to do something different in this regard? And finally, are there ways of targeting the poor specifically for health interventions? In what way is it legitimate? In what way is it socially efficient to identify those at the bottom of the income hierarchy for uh, health interventions? That's all I've got for today. Any last questions? See you next time.